All right, so we got imperialism and nationalism. Talked about this last chapter. So use the examples that I gave yesterday and even think back to the last chapter for this. It's all leading to World War One. All right. Okay. Okay. So we talked about nationalism already. So we really dove in and talked about what country really building up nationalism during this time, building up to World War One. Oh, Germany. Yeah, good job. So we mentioned about Germany and how who who was it? Who was it that inspired a lot of German nationalism that unified the country through these aggressive wars and trying to build a sense of culture through uh, these kind of folk tales and stories? Go ahead, why? Bismarck, you have to job. So we talked about Bismarck. We mentioned about how Germany now is looking to kind of take the reins when it comes to the leading world power. As a lot of these new innovations were coming from Germany with the second wave. 
We talked about the uh, railways, we talked about the trains, how they're utilized in Germany to help advance, mobilize troops all across uh, really Germany that we know of and to mobilize the troops on the borders of their enemies like Austria, the settlements where we talked about France. Now they defeated them pretty quick. All right, one last thing though with Bismarck and nationalism, where did they crown the new Kaiser, the emperor of Germany? Where did they crown him? As they just unified after defeating France, they wore a partner. Yep, good job, Palace of Versailles, right? So that's going to already create a bitter rivalry, right? One that's going to cause a lot of tensions moving forward between France and Germany. All right, so Kaiser, what? What was his name? Kaiser, what? Connor. Wilhelm the first. Yep, good, good. So we'll talk about Wilhelm the second, okay, as we move forward here with World War One, and how he's going to even take this idea of German nationalism and move it towards warfare, right? So again, with Bismarck. Okay, building a sense of German nationalism, unifying the country, and at the same time, uh, kind of starting a rivalry with France next door neighbor. Right, also, one thing to note with nationalism here, what territory did Germany take away from France? So this was the disputed territory we talked about yesterday. Well, I mentioned in the video yesterday. Go ahead, Matt. Alsace-Lorraine. Alsace-Lorraine, yep, good job. So that territory is right between France and Germany, right? It's disputed. Well, at one point it was French, and at the other time, uh, Germany saying, hey, well, there's a lot of German-speaking people in this land. At the same time, there's a lot of what there? What resources are there? Go ahead, Austin, coal. Coal, yep, good job. Good job. So that's going to help build industrialization in Point Germany. Also, the Rhine River runs right through it. So when it comes to transporting materials, why not have a means of natural transportation right there? So, yeah, France is a little bitter about this, right? Germany just woke them in a war and they crowned their new king or emperor Kaiser in the palace of Versailles. Yeah, this is causing a lot of tensions between these two countries. All right, okay. Uh, what about imperialism here? So with Bismarck, right, we mentioned about him. What conference did he lead? You guys had a simulation here already with this at the game. And you guys just wanted me to throw away the packets. Oh, so many frameworks. The zero at the Berlin Conference. The Berlin Conference. Yep, good job. And this was a means to try to have some sort of peace moving forward. As these countries are looking elsewhere to try to claim land, territory, and extract resources from, okay, let's say Africa, obviously Africa's big, Asia as well, okay, uh, sooner or later, these countries are going to butt heads. Sooner or later, these countries are going to um, compete against one another to a point to see who's going to be the next world power. So yeah, with the Berlin Conference, Bismarck realized that eventually these countries are going to pull out. If it's not internally there in Europe, but elsewhere. The ads are expanding to Africa, Asia. There's only a limited amount of land out there. So as these countries are growing closer and closer and building up their militaries and innovating, it's like they're flexing out one another. Okay, it's like they're just waiting for something to spark a conflict. All right, so, so we already mentioned imperialism. I gave that example already with the bigger brother, little brother, right? And now, um, Hampton wants to play a video game or something. He just beats you up, takes control of the town. Yeah, probably. Probably won't be the shit here. Yeah, okay. All right, so we got nationalism. We got imperialism. All right, we're going to move on. We're going to talk about militarism today. Okay. Well, do you want to join our Minecraft show? No. Okay. Absolutely not. Why? No, sure. if, please, why? We have to change our books. Yeah, we have to change our books. We have to change our books. <laughs> all right, here are your terms. Quiet. I'm going to go find Ms. O'Neill. Maybe she's not here. Okay, there you go. There you go. So we got militarism, jingoism, Anglo-German naval arms race, U-boat. Or I'll talk about U-boat here soon. And dreadnought. Jingoism. It's a lot like nationalism. But I figure it's important to put in there. No, I 
being sponsored by the bridge wall. Look at what it is, bridge. Is that that like metal wall? Okay, you guys should be working on your vocab. Nor This video is sponsored by no VPN. Work with your sponsors tomorrow, guys. Come on. What space? I tried to get them to stop, but they wouldn't. <laughs> they just kept going. That's so. Uh, I'm going to replay this thing. Go ahead. Yeah. You're going to try and stop. I told them they should be working on the cake guy. I was out all this week. Yesterday had a virtual day. But now I'm going to make up for it, right? Uh, <laughs> do you need Yeah. For him. Oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, my gosh. I love it. Ashley. Nice cut, G. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I'm recording here. He's, he's I'm recording. recording. Jack, it's first period. So what? I just tell him. See, see that's what I always say. So what? Look. It's like seven oh, views. Right, right. It's like not nice. Yeah. Like, oh, you feel like seven views, Bowman. Tell him now. Say, I like you. Yeah, and then you smack it right inside the head. Yeah, I did one of those before. I put the bowl on top. <laughs> yeah. All right. Don't worry. He has his wrestling cut. He, yeah, yeah. he has to slap me in the back of the neck today. Whoa. Yeah, whoa, you heard whoa, that, whoa, you too. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thanks, Miss O'Neill. Yeah. I'd say good luck, Wyatt, but uh, yeah, good luck. This is a good one. You guys need another minute? Okay, one more minute. All right, okay, so militarism, what does that mean, militarism? What does militarism mean? It's a fall face. The belief or desire of a government or people that a country should maintain a strong military capability and be prepared to use aggressively to defend or promote their Awesome, good job, good job. So with militarism, especially during this time, in these countries in Europe, even the United States, they thought, well, the only way we can have a competitive edge in the world is if we build up our military. More importantly, the Navy, right? As 
as uh, these countries are looking to expand and imperialize lands all around the world, they need to have a need to a strong need. Okay. So with militarism, you're going to see a lot of advancements and innovations with weaponry during World War I. Okay, we'll focus a lot on that. I'll even have some of an activity where you'll do is a little bit of research about some of the weaponry that's been introduced in World War I. And with militarism, that's where the government countries really focus heavily on funding a strong military. Again, without it, okay, as these countries in Europe are all competing against one another through this imperialistic age and this industrial age, well, a lot of attention is going towards the military. Even still to this day, right, there's a lot of funding towards the military, so that the United States especially to keep this competitive edge. Right? And uh, you think about the Cold War after World War II, and uh, yeah, these countries get a little bit more relaxed today, but now the tension is heightening with Russia and Ukraine, China, Taiwan. It's one of those things that's getting a little scary, where these countries are putting a lot more funding towards their militaries. So it's not like it's going away. It's not like it just disappears after World War I, World War II. It's just kind of an ideology where during certain circumstances, you got to put a little bit of extra time and funding towards the military. Jingoism, what do you got here? Jingoism. So this is very similar to nationalism. So what do you got here, Chris? Yeah, good job, right? So this is a form of nationalism. And again, I won't try to trick you on the test. I'll just probably put nationalism there. But I wanted to make sure I put this term, just in case if you read about it in the textbook or if I have it on the slide, okay, you just know what it is. I know it's an odd term, but it's a little bit of a weird term. So just wanted to make sure you made the connection that this is an extreme sense of national pride, patriotism, okay? And this is all coming together with a term I had you write down the last chapter, okay, when we were kind of looking at the evolutionary theory, Charles Darwin, right, and comparing it to these countries of Europe. And what was that? What was that called? What was that called? <laughs> Social Darwin's. Yeah, good job. Good job. So survival of the fittest. The only way you can do it is if you expand, if you build up your military. All right, so since we're talking about the building of the military, Anglo German native farms, what do we have here? Yeah, here. Hi, Connor. The outbreak of the Great Britain and Germany that occurred last decade of the 19th century until the advent of the World War II. Yep, good job. Good job. So, we all know that Great Britain was the strongest state in the world up to this point. Still are. Okay, it's not like it's going away. But with Germany, they're going to look to try to compete with Great Britain. Okay, challenging their naval waters. Okay. And uh, it's one of those rivalries that's going to last in the World War I, causing Great Britain to maybe look for an ally, maybe look for uh, an alliance with another country that they beat it out with quite a bit, as we've talked about in this, in this uh, in the course of this year so far. So, what do you think Great Britain is going to maybe look to ally with? Who do you think? Go ahead, Austin. Yeah. yeah, France. Good job. Good job. So, you can see how these two countries that hate each other for so, so long. We talked about the Seven Years' War, we talked about a lot of the issues with uh, the American Revolution, how these countries were duking it out even then, and now they're drawn closer together. Why? Well, because of Germany, right? Because of Germany. Germany's rising to become a world power. And again, the only way they can do that is if they build up their navy. So this arms race is to see who can pump out the most dreadnoughts or battleships, okay? Plotter look at a battleship. And eventually, Germany will try to look for a different needs of combating Great Britain in the open water. Uh, Great Britain will have double the amount of battleships and just kind of surface battleships than Germany. And Germany is the second rank naval force in the world at this point. So Germany thought, well, we can't beat them when it comes to production with their navy, so let's just try to find a different way, a different means of combating against Great Britain in the open water. And that's with U-boats. What is a U-boat? What is a U-boat? Awesome, basically. So it's a submarine. Yeah, good job. So submarine warfare will be introduced here in World War I, and how Germany is going to utilize these U-boats to go undetected under the water to try to combat against Great Britain, their strong naval force on the surface of the world with these dreadnought modern battleships. So U-boats, we're going to talk quite a bit about, and how they're intercepting a lot of supply ships, a lot of cargo ships coming from the United States to Europe, and just causing a lot of havoc for Great Britain as they're controlling the English Channel and uh, looking to show their supremacy in the world on the open waters. All right, so U-boat is pretty much just a submarine. All right, uh, Dreadnought. We got Dreadnought. Kind of described this one already. Chris, go ahead. Yeah, good job. Good job. 
So these battleships are starting to look a little bit different. It's not like they're made of battle wood anymore. You just yeah, utilize the sails to go place to place. Now you're applying the steam engine to it. And at the same time, you have thick armor that's suited all around the battleship. Artillery, different types of weaponry that are applied to the battleship, the dreadnought. Yeah, that gives it more of a modern look. All right, so these dreadnoughts are just what we know as a modern day battleship. And during this time, building up to World War I, we see these countries in Europe, even the United States, investing a lot of money into these modern day battleships. Okay, all right, is there any questions on that? Okay, so real quick, just want to talk about militarism today. Uh oh, does anybody know who that guy is at the top? Right there, ripping his shirt apart. Oh, okay, thank you, thank you. I was gonna say I might have to put like John Cena up there. Uh, you probably don't even know who John Cena is, do you? Okay, okay. So Hollywood Hulk Hogan up there, yeah. So in order to try to compete again, these European countries have to put a lot of time and effort funding into their military. So militarism is just the build up to glorification of a country's military. What about these two guys up above here on, on the side? You guys know them? That might be it. Matt? Well, Steve Urkel. Steve Urkel, okay, good. Anybody else? No, the other guy? Saved by the Bell? We have never heard of the Bell. B, you have? Yeah. Never read it. Uh, Screech. Yeah, never heard of yeah. Well, anyway, so with militarism, again, these European countries, even the United States, they're all putting a lot of dedication, a lot of time and funding into building up their military. And for Germany, especially. Right, and they have a lot of what nationalism, right? National pride within their military. Yeah, they just defeated Austria, which was one of the largest land armies in Europe, in seven weeks. They defeated France, right, in a couple of months, for almost a year, right? And uh, they did so with ease, and they did so because they have a stronger, more innovative military. And we talked about the railroad system. We talked about trains, how they're utilized to mobilize troops, soldiers quick, and for Germany especially. They thought, well, there's going to be no one that can challenge us when it comes to our innovation, when it comes to our buildup of the glorification of our military. But in one place in particular, Germany can put a lot more emphasis in is their navy, right? Is their navy. And that kind of goes along with what we're talking about that Anglo German naval arms race. These two countries are duking it out for supremacy in the open water, right? And uh, that's only going to cause a bit of rivalry to a point where Great Britain's going to have to look. Maybe the ally with someone else, okay, France, which we already mentioned. And that's driving these two countries together. So we'll talk about this alliance system here soon enough, but I just want to focus on militarism today. All right, so again, applying the social Darwinism in order to stay adaptive and evolve, right? In order to survive in this environment where it's so hostile, and these European countries are looking to expand, building up their militaries, right? The only, the only thing you can do is to go along with it. Right, is to imperialize land in Africa and Asia and build up your military just like these other European countries. So reasons for militarism. So to keep the imperialized in line. So as, as you're expanding in Africa and Asia, right, these European countries need to try to keep control there so that they can build up their economies, build up their industries, even focus more attention again on building up their militaries. So obedience, right? Try to control the imperialized land. Uh, compete with other powerful nations. So expansion. So the only way you're going to claim some of these territories overseas is if you have a bigger, stronger military, especially navy. Right? If you have a stronger navy, chances are the other won't mess with you. And if you're extracting these resources and taking them out of the country on these territories in Africa and Asia, you want to make sure they're protected. These supply lines are protected. So for Great Britain especially, they dominated the waters. So no one really challenged them when it came to this overseas expansion. Germany's starting to, but at the same time, when we talk about the Berlin Conference, Great Britain really had a hold of these African territories. The reason for it is because they were the strongest at the time. They're trying to appease them, make sure that there won't be a conflict with them. All right, and then protect assets around the empire. So you have to sustain your kind of government as it was at this time. So Kaiser Wilhelm, especially. Or as Germany being united for the first time, you want to make sure that the people are behind you so that there won't be a rebellion or revolt. 
And uh, having a strong military, building that national pride in that military is a great way to make sure that you keep this sustained structured government and country. Also, right, it's nice to have these militaries focused along your border, to protect yourself from an invasion, let's say. So France has been focusing a lot of attention on that border between Germany because you never know when they could maybe attack again. All right, so military strength in 1914. So before the war here, so you got five largest armies. So here's the number of soldiers. Russia has the highest number. Right, they have the highest number. We will talk about Russia here. Okay, I'm going to break away from World War One. We'll get towards the end and mention a little bit more about Russia where they're at. Okay, they're not near as innovative as these other Western European countries. You guys remember talking about Peter the Great? You guys remember how we mentioned about him building this winter palace? What was that called? A window to the what? What was that called? Connor. Window to the West. Window to the West. Good job. You remember Peter the Great? What did he do to his nobility? What did he do to him? Paul. He made him king of years. Yeah, good job, right? Because he wanted to try to infuse these Western views and ideas and perspectives into Russia. They're still not caught up with that. And especially when we get to the Industrial Age, they're not even close to what Germany, Great Britain, even France are capable of. So Russia is still catching up. Also, they do lose a war to Japan. Uh oh, Japan. So at this time, when you're looking at these countries in Europe, uh, if one of them loses to a country in Asia, do you think they're viewed as a strong power? No, no, they're not, right? And I'm not just saying that because, of, you know, when we're focusing on imperialism taking over these lands, but Japan is going through a measure, a means of production and industrialization ever since the United States opened up trade with them. So we'll talk about that too and how Japan becomes a powerhouse in Asia. But Russia does lose a war to Japan, so they're kind of falling behind. So when it comes to building up their military, they're trying to focus heavily on, let's say, this small progress they're trying to prepare for. Germany, we already mentioned about the Franco-Prussian War. We talked about the Seven Weeks War. Their military's near the top, right? When it comes to the most innovative, well, they're there. France, four million, they just got defeated by Germany. So they're putting a lot of time and effort into trying to solidify that border between France and Germany. Austria, we already mentioned about Austria, too. So Germany defeated them within seven weeks. So you can see why their military is strong too. They were sharing a border with them. And finally, Italy, we didn't get to talk about them too much, but they unified at the same time as Europe. They're just unifying as a country. And uh, the only way to compete again is to innovate, is to focus a lot of time on your military. Militaries. All right, so right here, two largest navies. So you can see here with Great Britain, they still are leading when it comes to dreadnoughts, battleships, when it comes to the amount of soldiers, sailors, in their navy, right? Battle cruisers, that's almost even, but in any case, you can see Great Britain still has the advantage. Their policy at the time was to say double the amount of the next force. So Germany is the second strongest naval force leading up to World War One. So Great Britain realized the only way they can keep this edge is if they stay double above Germany, okay, above the next force. And that is what's sparking that German and uh, Anglo naval arms race. Who do you think is three? Who do you think is three? They mentioned them a little bit. They mentioned them a little bit. Who do you think is three? So by the time we get to the 1900s, it'll be duking out with a war with Spain. Not over in Europe, but over in the Western Hemisphere. Who do you think that? Third one. Oh, United States. Yeah, good job. United States. So we're growing. We're getting there. Okay, like I mentioned already in the 1860s when these countries were all industrializing, what were we going for? It? What were we going for? Go ahead, Paul. No, no. Honor. The Civil War. War. Yeah, the Civil War. So we're catching up. We're trying to get there with these European countries. When it comes to imperialism, again, we're trying to catch up and make sure that we can compete with these countries in Europe. All right, so here's what a dreadnought looks like. Again, it's a modern day battleship, right? So at the time, yeah, it was steam powered. Okay, a little bit different than today, obviously. Nuclear powered battleships, cruisers, submarines, even. But uh, these dreadnoughts are what we kind of look like, uh, look, typically look at a battleship today. Again, they're kind of getting rid of the wood, they're getting rid of these sails, and they're utilizing the new forms of uh, mechanisms to help power these battleships like steam engines. 
And when it comes to armor, all right, take the heavily plated armor all around the battleship, placing guns, artillery all on it. And it's what we know of today as a, as a battleship. Eventually, towards the end of World War I, Great Britain's going to put a lot of time and effort into putting radar systems okay, within these dreadnoughts. Why? Why? Hey, Paul. The U-boats, right? The job. The job. So as we get to World War I, we'll talk about, again, these, these uh, new forms of weaponry that are being applied to these massive ships to help protect them out in the open water, especially with Great Britain. They realize the U-boats, well, they're picking them off left and right. So weaponry, innovation just really kickstarts through this time of World War I. The airplane, which we'll talk about here soon. Okay, the airplane is going to go through a lot of innovation, too. And right in the early 1900s, who created the first airplane, the first flight? Who was it? Go ahead, Chris. The Wright, the Wright Brothers. Yeah, good job. You know where? Uh, nope, not Tennessee. But New Carolina. Yeah, okay, okay. You guys ever go to the Outer Banks? Kitty Hawk? Yeah, no? Okay, you guys ever go to the Outer Banks for vacation? Check it out. They have a museum there, the Wright Brothers. First flight. But like what I was getting at, these airplanes will go through a lot of innovation for World War I. It'll totally change. When we get to World War II, eventually towards the end, we'll see jet fighters. So you can see how weaponry, how innovation sparks during these conflicts, during these wars. All right, cool. We'll talk about the Alliance system more tomorrow. All right, we'll talk about that more tomorrow. Well, here's your assignment. Oh, oh no. We have five minutes. Come on now. Better than three. That's better than three. Oh. Hey, there's only three questions. There's only three questions. Okay. And it's a political cartoon. Yeah, see, I'm not that bad. All right. Okay. So here's your political cartoon analysis. All right. It's pretty easy. There's three questions talking about militarism. All right, so a couple of these countries might be hard for you to, you know, find and see exactly who they are, but uh, do your best. We'll talk about them for tomorrow, so we're all on the same page, but a lot of them you can probably get, okay? A lot of them you can probably get. But uh, when it comes to militarism, when it comes to these countries expanding their navies all around the world, well, sooner or later, you know, it's going to crack. And that's a leading cause to World War One. All right, so let me publish that for you. Again, do tomorrow. Do tomorrow. First question. Third question. No, 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 not not you actually. Where should I have? Oh, okay, okay. I was gonna say like a little bit. Yeah, that, that's where should. Oh, hey guys, real quick. Again, this is the start of the chapter. So the page at the top. I know I went over this yesterday, but just to make sure again, you can click on this page here. You can find the presentation. You can find the textbook. Okay, the purpose objectives, and we are at World War One. Okay, all right, perfect, perfect.